What's happening, everybody? Welcome back to this co-branded Packaday Acme Packing Company podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow, of course, the one and only Justice Mosqueda at J-U-M-O-S-Q. Justice, we are not celebrating a victory Monday as we're recording this, although we do have two Monday night football games on. How, how do you feel about double Monday night football games? Uh, I don't like when they overlap. I know. Um, so I'm a West Coaster, so I'm obviously biased and all this stuff. Everyone complains about the second <laughs> Monday night football game, the opening week of the season. Um, I like when they stack. And yeah, kick off at 8 o'clock. Who cares? I totally agree. I totally agree. Yeah, it, I, I feel like I need an NFL red zone for uh, for the two games, like just yeah. to like, keep switching between it. But no, it's enjoyable nonetheless. I'll, I guess I'll take it over nothing. But um, and not, a, not a victory Monday, a disappointing game for the Packers. I think more disappointing because – they had the 12 point lead and then they did not have a 12 point lead when the final whistle sounded, which of course is always going to be a level of disappointing. But I just want to start off by asking you, how are you feeling about your Green Bay Packers? Um, not great. Not great. Uh, I, you know, Atlanta gives, gives a really specific type of um, problem on the offensive side of the ball in that they can run the ball very well, and they also have Kyle Pitts and Bijan Robinson, which is not something I don't know if any other team in the NFL can replicate that. So it gives you, you know, some pretty unique challenges. Um, but the fact that the Packers weren't able to, you know, stop a what was it a thirteen play or a thirteen point run in the fourth quarter or whatever it was, um, that's certainly disappointing. I think uh, they got a lot better of a bar for what the average NFL team is going to be this upcoming season than in week one, which is something that we brought up where we're like, I don't know how much of this translates moving forward. Um, it'll be interesting to see the adjustments because, again, I think you kind of throw out the Bears game. And, you know, usually that the biggest adjustment of the season is after that first loss, right? Because you yeah. say, okay, this is what we didn't realize that we need to adjust because – you know, you can't tackle practice. There's all those sort of things like preseason, no one's game planning, stuff like that. Um, thought the Falcons made it a point to go after Woolen and uh, Inigbare in the run game and then just do whatever they wanted to Rudy Ford. So how do you work around that? I'm not sure. Those guys play a ton of snaps. I mean, Rudy Ford is a starting safety. Inigbare and Woolen, you know, Woolen's first guy up. On the interior defensive line, Enigbara is one of, you know, three guys who are basically rotating as the injury replacement for Rashawn Gary right now. Um, how you manage that, I'm not sure, but obviously they need to do something because the Falcons looked at him directly in the eye and said, we're going after these guys. And they just collapsed them over and over and over again. I think the first thing would be not putting them in the same spot, not putting them together next to each other would maybe be a, a decent starting point. Yes. Um, like, you yes. Know, so Concerning maybe... the amount of times that they were just lined up next to each other and they were just like, well, we're just going to run behind Lindstrom and McGarry then. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would be the first thing of like, all right, if you're like put Kenny in front of Enigbare and put like, you know, you know, make it so that it's not, um, you know, maybe put Rashawn Gary or Preston Smith or somebody who's a little bit more physical than behind Colby Wooden, you know, but you got to figure out something and not stack those guys. Because, yes, on a couple different occasions, they ran right at him and you had the one where they ended up hugging each other. There was another one where they yeah. both ended, I think, right at the end of the game where they ended up collapsed on the ground next to each other. And, yeah, Atlanta felt like they could run right at those guys. They felt, I think they kind of felt, I mean, obviously it was more of those two, but they, they weren't fearing Green Bay's run defense all that much. And when you run 40 plus times, 200 yards plus, I think you, you brought up a great point of like how they couldn't stop the run in the fourth quarter. And a lot of this was not just the fact that they couldn't stop it, but it was how it came to fruition. Uh, we've all been over how much Atlanta dominated that fourth quarter. Green Bay's offense couldn't do anything three and out, three and out, four and out. And in the meantime, Green Bay's defense couldn't stop anyone. It was just the most uncomplimentary football you could possibly imagine. But it even maybe would have been slightly different if Bijan just rips off an 80-yard run. And then you had like a missed assignment and Drake London or Kyle Pitts goes for like 60 yards. And you're like, crap, we made we made a you know mistake or whatever happened and you gave up two big plays and things are different. But to just nickel and dime you and paper cut you to death, for the entirety of the quarter, when you went in with a 12 point lead and you're thinking, all right, Desmond Ritter is going to have to beat you now. You're probably in a pretty good spot. They're like, no, we're just going to keep 
running it right at you. And to just see it where they could not get stops at all and field goal or touchdown, field goal, field goal um, to just kind of bleed everything out. It, th that was the really, really painful aspect of it. Yeah, because I actually it, – it felt because the run game was so dominant that, you know, there were more big runs or something like that. And I watched the film this morning, which, by the way, we talked about this. The, usually the film is like a half hour long with all the cuts in it and all that stuff. So they show the scoreboard, they show the end zone angle, they show the overtop angle. This one was like an hour and 15 minutes. So that just gives you – and that's all just game time on the field, right? That's not the clock burning um, nope. because there was a run play the play before. That gives you an example of how many snaps this defense had to play because they just could not get off the field this past game. Um, I thought that there were going to be more explosive plays. And really, you know, obviously there was like the – there were like the two runs that Bijan had where he like yep. broke three tackles on each one of them. Um, but outside of that, it was just a whole lot of like, we got eight, nine yards. Darnell Savage made the tackle. He flexed, you know, it's second and two and we get the first down on the next play. Like that, it, that was basically the entire fourth quarter. Yeah. Yeah. There, there weren't very many like one and two yard runs and there weren't very many like 15, 16 yard runs. It was, also, like there weren't four. a lot of TFLs either. The, the, no. the Falcons ran like 45 times or something like that. They, the Packers got one TFL. I mean, they're just resetting the line of scrimmage every single time. And I know people are like – I know Packers fans, like the whole thing is like the Joe Barry, Joe Barry, Joe Barry, how much more help does he need to get? Like, dude, watch that defensive front. Watch that defensive front and tell me like why it – okay, maybe they're not going to get a first-round pick, you know, worth of value in return for Wyatt like they, they need to add I mean I don't even know if this is something that they can do this season but like they're gonna need to add help on that interior defensive line because it's it's not getting the job done and you know Chicago was just really 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 bad on the interior yeah I, I in hindsight I don't think this would have changed that much uh, honestly I don't think he's that great of a football player but in hindsight I'm sort of surprised they didn't elevate Jonathan Ford just as like an extra body mm -hmm. like as an extra big dude um, just to give them a little bit more physicality up front. I don't know that what that would have meant for who else they would have had to deactivate or whatever, but like I probably would have rather had Jonathan Ford than Ennis Gaines in that game, just as an extra big body in there. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that's not going to solve the problem entirely in any way, shape or form. Just like I'm, I'm surprised they didn't maybe call up an extra defensive lineman, but I, that, that was the big concern that I had going in of all, of all the different things that people were talking about this offseason. My biggest concern was this is a run defense that allowed five yards per carry. You have the same, basically two of the starting safeties you had a season ago in Savage and Ford. Your corners are basically the same, except you're playing Keyshawn Moore and you don't have Eric, Keyshawn Nixon more and don't have Eric Stokes right now. Otherwise, it's the same group. Devondre and Quay, same linebackers. Edge group, you added Lucas Van Ness and – Unless he's the guy that's going to completely save your run defense, then there's not a whole lot of other hope. I know in the defensive line, people are like, well, Slayton and and um, Wyatt are going to play more. And it's like, well, Wyatt hasn't shown exactly to be a dominant run defender. And Slayton yeah. is kind of hot and cold. And then you've got two rookie defensive linemen in you know Wooden and, and um, Brooks who yeah. are not run defenders. And I, I thought Brooks did play a little bit better. I mean, Woolen, Woolen got attacked. Woolen got attacked. Brooks – at least can win with his hands and get into the backfield, create a little bit of penetration and stuff that can mess some stuff up. But Woolen, I know they have him listed at like 270, whatever, still. Um, I doubt that he's that size, but yeah, he's still, he's not where you need him to be, to be playing that many snaps as a run defending defensive tackle in the NFL. No, and I mean, that's the thing is you just don't, I don't know where the, the help comes from. This is very similar to the the defense that they had trying to stop the run. And I know everyone wanted to use like the, like, well, they're, they got a new scheme this year and they're going to do some different things. Like, like they didn't try different things in 2022 when they couldn't stop the run. Like they tried some things with the same guys and they didn't get much out of it. So I do think this is going to be a continued issue. I'm hopeful that, you know, Atlanta, is, like you mentioned, they do have a Bajan Robinson and they've got a pretty darn yeah. good offensive line and a couple of different things that they can throw at you. That is slightly unique. I thought they did a really nice job in the first quarter of really spreading Green Bay out wide, using some of the quarterback keepers to the outside. And um, you know, even in the the short situations where they kind of lined up for the QB sneak and then pitched it out to Bijan, there was different things they did throughout the yeah. game that really just stretched Green Bay horizontally. And then they would counter it right back with, you know, hitting them right up the gut. And 
Green Bay just never, never got in rhythm defensively for what Atlanta was trying to do. It was just like anytime they they tried to counter something, Atlanta had a, a, a another counter for it, and it just it just never got never got worked out. That was a really prepared football team. Um, the fact that they had that quarterback sneak stuff. Yeah, you mentioned you know the pitches to the edge, which they they ran the same formation, same play twice. Um, yeah. And what it is, it's you know unbalanced. So you're creating like a really, really, really long surface on one side, and the running back is offset that way anyway. And you just pitch it out. Um, Green Bay lined up to it poorly two times, um, and that's that is what it is. Like that's one negative thing you know that you can put you know, on the Joe Barry checklist because there were certainly some poor performances like physically on the field. Like some some of these players should feel bad that they cleared NFL checks for this game. Um, but that that's one thing that you can put on Barry um, for sure was, was those. And then I, I thought they did a pretty bad job of uh, the quarterback run game. Um, obviously, all 10 of those carries weren't for Desmond Ritter. Um, but when he did get some of those option looks, I mean, he would just – basically just teleport on the edge. Um, yeah. Rashawn Gary got yelled at by uh, Russell, Russell Douglas on that. That I think it was a touchdown, right? I, yep. I'm pretty sure yep. he got him for a score. Um, tough, tough. I mean, Rashawn Gary is going to be a player who is going to be asking for the world, right? I mean, he's going to be asking for the, the Nick Bosa contract, right? Biggest contract ever in the history of defense. And he can't play contain and he can't set an edge. Um, what do you do with that? I don't know. I mean, it's a pick. Do you let that guy walk? Probably not. You talk about him as, you know, one of the best guys in the locker room, all that stuff. Look at how he worked to get back from his ACL tear to being able to play games at the beginning of the season. Um, probably don't want those guys not in the locker room and players to see, you know, you letting that talent walk. Um, but, you know, there's certainly things that you have to work around with the skill set of all these guys on the field. And I just... I don't think there's enough talent, particularly in the spine of this defense. That interior defensive line, those safeties, um, the linebackers, they're not, like, they're fine. They're fine. But you paid a first-round pick and, you know, premier money to uh, to uh, Devondre Campbell for those guys. So, I don't know. This might just be the story of this year's Packers team. Well, let's talk about that because I think there's a, a couple things to unpack there. First of all, I, I want to – agree with you and I want to bring I think the first set of discussions up is this team gets talked about as a young and inexperienced football team they're the youngest team in the league the most frustrating thing about this game for me was how some of the veterans played on defense I thought Kenny Clark had a really nice day overall I know yeah. uh, PFF didn't like Beast. him in run yeah I he was really the, these past two get like he looks really like good. he's an all pro right now he looks like he's an all pro again he looks really good I don't know why PFF didn't like him in this game I really really liked him in this game but um I didn't think Devondre had a good game. I didn't think Rashawn had a good game. Preston's another one. I didn't think played really great. They PFF liked him more. I don't know why. Um, I didn't think uh, – I thought Jair had a really tough game in this one. Yeah. Um, some of the stuff he got beat on in coverage, it's going to happen from time to time. Um, I thought his run defense was basically non-existent for a good portion of it. Um, yeah, I just thought a lot of the veterans in this game that, that Green Bay needs to show the way. I thought Razul had a pretty nice day, other than the, the best part is, I think you brought it up as well, as he gets after Rashawn Gary for busting an assignment, which I love. And then like a play or two later on the next drive. Yes. The wheel routes. An assignment, yeah. Yes. By, by yes. Bajan, and it's just like, oh my God. Um, but I, I do like that he's trying to hold people accountable. Like just has to do it for himself too, I guess. But yeah, a lot of the veterans in this this game for a, a team that is chock full of rookies and inexperienced, it was by far and away the veterans on defense outside of Kenny Clark that I was at, I was wanting a lot more out of. Yeah, I agree. I mean, just a bad defensive performance in general. And, you know, some of that does come down to coaching and stuff like that, but also some of it comes down to do your job. The the players. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there there were people I had a thread where I, you know, jokingly said, why would Joe Barry do this? And it was just clips of players blowing their assignments. Right. And, you know, there's some bad people uh, in, in my replies and stuff like that. And one, one of my responses was just like, what do you want them to do? Sure. Like, do you want them to bench these players? Cause these, um, I, obviously it's coming up in the film room and they're saying, Hey, you messed up here. Let's get that fixed. So beyond that, now what do you bench a player? Are you benching Jair for some of this stuff? Are you going right. to release a play? Like, what What can you do? What can you do at this point other than ask these players 
please, for the love of God, execute your assignment. Do your 111th and do your job. Bill Belichick, do your job. I, but I think that brings us to a larger point here of anytime you hear about this defense, everyone wants to talk about all the talent that's on this defense. The, the multiple first round picks that it was eight or nine. I've, I've lost count of how many first round picks that are on this. There's, defense. A, th there's a thousand of them. If there's, you, uh... there's a thousand. There's a lot more like top 100 picks on this, this defense as well. You've obviously pay, paid money to Razul, Devondre Campbell. Um, you know, you, you definitely have some deficiencies. Uh, Darnell Savage is a first round pick, but um, obviously has not played to that level in a couple of years now. And then Rudy Ford, same thing. Like you didn't put any investment into that second safety position, but there is, a metric butt ton of resources that have been put into this defense, either via top draft picks or free agent money. And it has not, you know, had any sort of return on investment that you want to see. So then the, the obvious question becomes, is it the person who has been gifted these talented players that is not using them correctly, coaching them correctly, getting them schemed up correctly, or was it the evaluation at the forefront and the person who is deciding to spend first round picks on these players and top 100 picks on these players and put a bunch of money into these players, are they not evaluating it correctly? Or, or there's, there's obviously a mix of both. There's obviously uh, they're good players, but they don't fit the scheme and those things haven't been married up. There's a variety of ways that that could go. I think this is a huge evaluation year for both of those things, both from a talent standpoint and from a coaching, you know, um, scheme standpoint. But where do you come out on that? Um, I kind of look at it like on an individual basis, which I know kind of feels like a cop out, but like, I don't think so. Uh, so like Jair, first round pick hit. Um, Rashawn Gary took some time, first round pick hit. Uh, Savage, I think, firmly qualifies under like was supposed to play safety in a petting scheme that has since changed. He doesn't really fit what they do um, in, in the quarters world that they live in. Um, Quay is fine for where he got drafted. I think Wyatt is a little disappointing at this point. And that's one where I'm really interested because do you, do you know who the longest uh, tenured coach on this Packers team is? I'm assuming Jerry Montgomery. It is Jerry Montgomery, who has been at his job since 2018. He was under McCarthy um, as the defensive line coach. Um, stuck under Penton, you know, uh, stuck under McCarthy first. Stuck under Penton under LaFleur. Stuck under um, LaFleur under Joe Barry. Now he's the run game coordinator. I can't sincerely. I don't know if Jerry Montgomery's developed a single interior defensive lineman since he's been here in 2018. I mean, he inherited Kenny Clark. Um, I think at that point, Mike Daniels was already trending downward, right? Yep. Um, Dean Lowry has not played his best football under Montgomery, and I don't think he was any good. They signed uh, Jaron Reed, who I don't think was any good last season. Um, Wyatt seems to be like the same as he was last year, which is like he's a good pass rusher, doesn't give you really much on, on rundowns. Um, and even then, like he's like – B, B minus pass rusher right now, right? Or something like that. It's not like he's blowing the doors off of anyone. Um, TJ Slayton looks fine. Woolen doesn't look like he's ready to play football. So, like, the best example of him developing a defensive lineman is, like, Kiki, <laughs> right? Who got, like, yeah. released in season. We still don't have an answer of, like, what? why he's gone. So, like, yeah. I that's one where I'm like, okay, I'm willing to entertain, like, the, the coaches thing. Um but I would point to Jerry Montgomery before Joe Barry first. And I don't want to sound like a Barry apologist. There are certainly things he needs to get better at. Like the unbalanced stuff in the quarterback run game, he, he needed to be better there for them to win the, that – or put away that football game at the very least. Um, but a lot of this stuff is like the players are messing up, man. And they're costing themselves a ton of money too, you know, in the process. So that's all going to play itself out. It is. And I think that's, like I said, is going to be a huge part of the evaluation this year. I do think, and you, you know, you talked about yours being a cop out. I think mine's even a bigger cop out. I do think it's somewhere in the middle. I do think, as you mentioned, some of the players were hits as far as draft picks. I think others have been misses. I don't, I don't feel like this is a team defense still. There were moments from time to time under under Mike Patton, under Joe Barry, where it felt like this was a team defense, but it ended up just kind of being a mirage and it never really carried over week to week. 
I'm not That's sure the part that... that sucks is just the communication and guys just sticking to their gut on what their plays are supposed to be, right? Like the the like two play example, the best one you already brought it up was, you know, Rashawn Gary trying to play both sides of the read option, allowing a touchdown. Russell's out there because Rashawn Gary couldn't pick one of the two options, right? Douglas has to do two things at the same time. He's yeah. mad because he's like, I just put bad film on the field. Plus, we just allowed this score, right? And then the the like, I don't know if it's the next play, but it feels like the next play on defense. Um, you know, the Falcons get into this weird, you know, three strong look, and you know, there's a wheel route out of the backfield. Russell doesn't know if he wants to play the wheel if he wants to play the route that's breaking across his face. He's supposed to, you know, breaking news. He's supposed to play the wheel. The wheel is yeah. just wide open. Bijan goes for a big one, and it's like. Damn it, guys. Damn it. Like, I, I know at the NFL level particularly, like, you allow some level of freelancing. Like, Jair, the interception that he dropped, right? That play is probably him breaking the rules of the defense and just taking a calculated risk, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you allow that wheel route. Uh, I, I believe the Keyshawn Nixon touchdown in week one, that was another one where, you know, he was trying to break the rules of that defense a little bit. And, you know, you give some of those guys some leeway, but sometimes you just want to play the damn rules. And I, where you draw that line is a pretty tough thing. It is, but they, they've just never seemed to really have a good balance of when to break the rules, when not to break the rules. And it just, it just feels like lapses is what it ends up feeling more like. Like the, the result one didn't seem like it just like stay in your spot. And if you would have stayed exactly where we're supposed to be and just kind of did his job, that wheel route, yeah. there's nothing there. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. So, yeah, that's frustrating. Um, I wanted to talk about one. It got it got brought up. I think Matt Schneidman was the one who initially posted it, and it got brought up to Matt LaFleur again today. Where we, the, the Falcons go empty, and you get Bijan out wide. Devondre's yeah. across from him. And you basically just run. They're in man coverage. Green Bay gets caught kind of with their pants down a little bit in man coverage. Um, I think I, I didn't look at it close enough, but it looked like two wide receivers, one running back, two tight ends. Was it a was it a twelve personnel that they came out in? Um, I think so, but I mean, you have to do the math on like what do you consider pits, right? Like that's yeah, that's fair. A whole that's, other thing. Yeah, but um, yeah, th th I think they come out. I think Green Bay's thinking, all right, they're gonna, you know, they're in like a twelve personnel or whatever again, whatever you want to count pits as, and they spread them out wide, and you end up with Devondre Campbell across from Bijan. Matt LaFleur said, you know, he trusts, you know, Devondre in that coverage, which is a, a statement in and of itself. But uh, then you get obviously some of the, the the rub routes that just naturally happen through the course of the play. It's a key third down in the game, third and three. Bijan is wide open for the first down, easy completion. And, and you know, it, it, it happens sometimes. What, I, what I'm sort of perplexed by, first of all, you, you have a five-man rush on the play. Um, not sure if you could just check out of that and keep one of those guys in the middle of the field to make it a little more complicated and challenging. Um, there's obviously a whole complexity that goes with that as well. But more importantly, like this probably doesn't work either, but like even if you just switched Quay and Devondre and let Devondre blitz and have Quay out in coverage, I feel a little bit better about it. it still probably gets completed, but like I feel at least you've got like a 4 3 40 guy out there across from him. But I don't know, your, your thoughts on that play that I know got a little bit more uh, I think playing attention than it, I don't know, whatever, but uh, thoughts on that play. Yeah. Um, first thing, personnel, the Quay Devondre thing, um, just because it's top of mind and I will forget about it if I don't talk about it right now. It seems like they do want to blitz Walker more. I agree. Um, this season. So I, I think they would rather have that athleticism come in as the pass rusher. Okay. okay. Um, the, so, okay, alignment. Um, Devondre Campbell playing seven yards off of Bijan when they need five or whatever it was, right? Um, there are pick plays in the NFL, and they are legal, and they decided in boardrooms. They are legal. Yeah. Um, if you are in man coverage and you do not have guys on different levels, which is, you know, different depths, they teams can just basically run interference, and you're at a threat of giving up a one-play touchdown at any point in the field. Yeah. Um, and that's why they align like that. I mean, you see it in college football. You can't run man coverage in college football anymore. Everyone will just run pick plays on you. Um, you know, the one that you point the that people point out to a lot is uh if you guys can find the Hunter Renfro touchdown against Alabama in the national championship game that uh you know Clemson beat Alabama at the end at the goal line 
and it's you know a, it's a pick play and they're getting man coverage and they're like we're gonna press the hell out of you and then they just run a little bit of interference and it's wide open touchdown i mean that's just what teams are gonna do now um i think lafleur said uh atlanta actually checked into that play once they got that look so i mean that's just another example of this is a very prepared football team right yep. where they see they see him off and they're like oh okay well, we can't run a, a shallow pick play. So instead what we'll do is we'll like run like a slot fade basically that like tries to pick that guy. And if we don't, you know, if it doesn't get called and we don't directly bump into him, then we can just run underneath it. I mean, that's – again, I, I, I think that more of that is – that's a very prepared football team, right? And uh, they were able to execute and they had a very specific skill set in Bijan and Pitts that I don't think is going to be around um, everyone else. Now, there are certain qualms I have with people and the suggestions that they have, right? So they're like, uh, someone in the presser asked, you know, um, why don't you put a safety on that guy? He's the running back. He's the, yeah. he's the least – he's supposed to be the least threatening of any of the options. So what are you going to do anytime they're in 12 personnel, like you said, because of the threat of them being able to get into empty – you have to play dime to 12 personnel? Okay, now what if they run? You can't – you yeah. you don't get a snapshot of how they're going to align That's while you decide what your personnel is going to be. That's not how this sport works. So to a certain extent, this does come down to, like, players got to make plays. Like, it, it really does break down to, to that because if the offense is comfortable enough that they can check and you're not going to be able to check out of a man coverage look as easily – as offenses are going to be able to check in, you know, different plays just because of the Chinese fire drill that happens if you're checking out a man coverage, right? Yeah. Um, it's just going to have to come down to, like, someone's going to have to make a play. And that either has to come from pressure or that's going to have to come from coverage. Um, it is what it is. And I know people don't want to hear that because they want to complain no, about but, Joe Barry. It's a legitimate thing, and it's especially a legitimate thing when the team's been gashing you for 200 yards rushing through the day. So, like, like you said, yeah, you could, you know, if they're just throwing all day long, then yeah, go and dime. Like, if it's the greatest show on turf and they're not actually going to hand to Marshall Falk and they're just going to throw to it to him all day, then like by all means, like, yeah, I think what Green Bay tried to use Allen Rossum as a seventh defensive back or something crazy in the game, it didn't work anyway. But like, if they're just going to throw all day, then by all means. But like, this team's gashing you up and down. You have yeah. to keep the two linebackers on the field in that formation. Um, but then if they split you out, you're going to get, you know, Devondre one-on-one -on -one with Bajan Robinson. There's actually one other play that they got. I think it was Devondre in the slot on Bijan and Bijan just kind of ran like a dummy route to the outside. And they kind of got, I don't know, not maybe lucky, but they didn't, you know, they didn't get anything off of it, but yeah, the, the, they, like you said, very well prepared team, well coached team. And they took advantage of mismatches and at very opportune times is when they called the QB keepers. And when they called the third and three, like they knew they had plays in mind for specific situations that they knew they were going to get advantageous looked looks and they used them at, exactly the right most backbreaking times for at least from a Packers side of things. Yeah. Just bad performance on defense in general. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I even have I'm trying to think if I have anything more to say. I don't think so. <laughs> Kenny Clark played well. Kenny Clark played well. We'll we'll call that out as Kenny a Kenny game. played well. Um I hope Lucas Van Ness is healthy. I hope his shoulder is not messed up because I think he's going to have to play more. Um, I, don't I don't know think... if you saw it. He did play one snap post-injury yeah. I saw today. I, I, yeah, I think you posted it with a with Yeah, I didn't, I didn't realize he did. I did not think he I came back know. for any snaps, but he played one snap. That was his only snap. He did not play after that, and there was a lot of ball game left after that. So it felt like maybe they tested out the brace, and I don't know if it didn't work, or they're just like, oh, we're not going to risk it or whatever, but yeah. played at least one snap afterwards. So take well, that for what it's worth. I think Enigbare and Hollins are going to have to give up a lot of snaps to him pretty soon because he has sand in his pants and they really don't. They don't. So. Yeah, I totally agree. Well, let, let's move to the offensive side of the ball. Let's talk about something positive because we've been mostly maybe not negative, but realistic through the first portion of this, uh, this show. But we were uh, pretty excited last week about some little snippets of Dontavian Wicks that we saw just him being able to get open down the field, thought that maybe there could be something there and that we could continue to see a little bit more of him. He had the very first play of the game, they call the flea flicker. 
They could probably call that for anyone. They could probably call it for Dobbs. They probably could have called it for Toure. They, they could, I think they probably could have called it for anyone. They call it for Dontavian Wicks, which is telling how much they trust him in that situation. Had a nice route, got open. Obviously, the flea flicker helps as well. Nice ball by Jordan ends up being a pass interference. You, he has the corner route to the end zone. Nice route, probably showed his hands a little bit too early where A.J. Terrell is able to, to bat the ball away. Obviously, has the yeah. touchdown play where he um, you know, catches the touchdown or you know, catches the ball and then makes a great move and uh, is able to get the touchdown on the play, breaks kind of a tackle in the process too. He had a couple other plays down the field where he was able to get separation. Ball just didn't go his way on the play, but I thought this was pretty darn encouraging from Dontavian Wicks. I thought he's had a really strong two weeks. Last yeah. week, it was a whole lot of um, him getting open on like, uh, I'm thinking of like a double post is what is one of the plays, right? Where um, he doesn't really, he's not really part of the progression on that specific play because of the pre-snap look that the defense gave, but he's getting open on deep routes and he's getting open fast and, you know, his release is really good. Um, so to see him actually get some of those targets this week um, was positive. Um, I, I think he played better than the stats. Um, Agreed. This week, and he had what, like four, forty in a touchdown in the second game. So, um, yeah, I mean, as, as long as Watson isn't going to be on the field, I'm I'm pretty big on Wicks getting some of these targets. What's going to be interesting is, you know, when Watson does come back, and what he was limited on Friday's practice, so maybe he'll yep. end up playing this week. He was listed as questionable, all that stuff. Um, maybe he plays this week. What, what that offense ends up looking like, right? Because it does seem like they want Reed in the slot full-time and want him to be the slot guy. Um, I guess there's like a three-man rotation at outside receiver with Wicks, Watson, and, and Dobbs in that I scenario so. because n- none of them have been fully healthy uh, throughout, throughout you know, summer that's now. True. So maybe, maybe that's what they do. But, yeah, w- Wicks, isn't, Wicks isn't going anywhere. Um, would be very surprised if he kind of – falls out of favor at wide receiver. The one thing I want to bring up, I can't remember Malik Heath getting a single target other than a one-on-one curl route. That was with, uh, he was matched up with uh, AJ Terrell. Jordan, please come on, man. (laughs) Know who you got out there. That's a second team all pro against a rookie undrafted free agent. Come on. Come on, man. Yeah, Be and, he, and, he, and he, he threw a trust ball to him too, because he threw it before he broke. Yes, and uh, Malik. He was like, "I have, I have the matchup. I'm throwing this." And I was like, "Dude, come on, yeah. man! That thing yeah, looked probably, like it was going to be a pick six for a second. It did. It did. Yeah. Um, he threw the anticipation. Heath didn't do him any favors. Terrell ate it for lunch. Probably should have been a pick six. I didn't see. I didn't think there was anywhere else to really go on the play either. At least, like, not that that's any. Like, not that you can still do it, but. Um, at least there wasn't like a guy running wide open somewhere else in the field where you're like, why are you keying in on Malik Heath? But yeah, he gave him a trust ball for some reason, and uh, Malik Heath did not pay off that trust in any any capacity. Great route by uh, AJ Terrell, though. Really great route. <laughs> great Terrell. Um, Terrell's Terrell's really good. I was really he's impressed fantastic. by his game. He's great. He, I mean, some of the plays he made in that game, really, really good stuff. But uh let's talk about a couple other things now that we talked about our, our positive thing and got that out of the way let's go back to being negative um let's talk a little bit about the running game we talked about the run defense being such an issue the run offense has been just as maybe equally bad um I don't know if it's maybe that bad but it's it's also not been great part of that is AJ Dillon part of that is the run blocking I, I was talking to to Nagler on this today of like because people are asking like why do you run behind Royce Newman and Rashid Walker on third and one when you need uh, a yard like your two backups and it's like yeah maybe not ideal uh, probably obviously not ideal but like I don't feel great running behind Josh Myers I don't feel super great running behind John Runyon Jr. and as great as Zach Tom has been it's not like he's a road grader either either he's not like a guy that's going to get a ton of movement in the run game that's not his you know forte it's like there's there's not a there's not a gap on that offensive line when you don't have Elton and Bakhtiari in there that I'm feeling super great about at, at any at any of those spots, so it's just kind of a mess right now. Yeah, I feel. I think I feel a little bit better about Runyon than you do. But yeah, the the that's Tom, fair. Tom, yeah, I mean Tom was a guy who he's there to be a pass protector first and yep. foremost, and you know he could do some stuff in the run game, but you're not asking him to Move get him. a lot of push on the line of scrimmage, reset the line of scrimmage, you know, a yard deep or whatever. Um, I thought Myers had a better game than Week One. He did. You no, know, he, he had a lot of run throughs and stuff. They were running more pin and pull last week. Um, obviously, they see a little bit uh, more of a 
different defense this week than, than they did last week when they were basically you know, playing against the defense that they see in practice all week. Um, Dylan still struggled, still trips over his feet. I mean, we saw, yeah. we made those jokes. We made the Plodzilla jokes. Like, I, I just, I don't know. He's four years in the league. Like, is his balance, are we assuming that the balance of a 240 pound running back is going to get better four years into his NFL career? No, this like, is it. this is just kind of who he is. It's, it's not like Wilson or Taylor, um, really did much with their opportunities either, but they got like four combined carries or something. Like, yeah. It's not like they were getting a bunch of looks. Um, thought it was interesting. Patrick Taylor was the guy who was out there in the two-minute drill um, over A.J. Dillon. So, you know, that kind of tells you what they think of his pass blocking ability and, and uh, you know, pass catching ability. Um, very, very weird situation. I mean, I just want – I would like to, reps to be split more evenly. After Aaron Jones, um, I, I want to see if any of these guys have a little bit more juice than Dylan does. I said this the other day, and maybe this is just harsh, but in what in what situation right now do you want AJ Dylan on the field for? Like, what are you being like? This is a people this would is say a, sh- like short yardage, yardage, but what's I don't that? Know. People would say short yardage, but I, I, don't I, know see, I disagree. That. Like he, to, first of all, we saw some of the balance issues and the the stumbling over it. It was a little bit more egregious this week than maybe it is on a normal occasion. But like, I feel like the the tighter it gets in the you know in the front where those holes and those creases are smaller, he doesn't run behind his pads all that great. He's not going to slither through a spot. He's not going to make someone miss if there is somebody there. And I kind of like, I, obviously I'm not breaking any news here. I like Aaron Jones in every situation, but like <laughs> the, the smaller back where you're going to squeak through a little bit. Plus he's like, he doesn't have that like speed to get through the hole either. If there is a tiny crease that even maybe he can get through, he doesn't get there fast enough. Like yeah. I, there, there is literally not because on third down, like in, in the two minute and the third down stuff, I do like Patrick Taylor better. I think Patrick Taylor is awesome in pass, uh, yeah, in pass yeah. pro. And I, I probably even better than Dylan. And I like him a little bit as a pass catcher better. And if he does get the ball in his hands, I actually kind of like Patrick Taylor a little bit more in that situation as well. He's got a little bit more wiggle to him. He does. does. And Wilson has a little bit more juice as a runner than what Dylan does. Like, I don't know. There, there's not a specific situation where I'm like, all right, this is it. It's AJ Dylan time. I just can't, I can't think of one. It's not, it's not pass catching. Like I said, I like Patrick Taylor and kind of the pass pro better. I, I don't know. There's nothing like I'm 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 pining for more AJ Dillon for. Was it the last two years they said it's uh what the Lamb- Lambo what weather or whatever? They're yeah. like, wait until it gets cold and then AJ Dillon is gonna and then he just didn't do anything. So I I don't know. Um I'm happy to be proven wrong, but his success Agreed. rate is something like thirty percent right now, which is near like the very bottom of the league. Um has not been has not been a good year for Dylan. And this is after rumors that you know the team was actively trying to trade for Jonathan Taylor who would have then replaced him and you know this is a contract year for Dylan too so tells you how my, much my, kind of confidence the team might have in him my favorite thing was like oh man how how are these running backs gonna feel that they talked about potentially acquiring Jonathan Taylor it's like Aaron Jones isn't going anywhere the Colts are taking on that yeah. contract and you're not moving on from him and yeah. who are you're, you're who are you trying to please Patrick Taylor, AJ Dillon, and Emmanuel Wilson, like they're they're fine. Like they're like, yeah. I mean, they, they might not be fine. They might not have a job, but like you're not like going out of your way to be like, oh, we got to make sure AJ's okay. How are his feelings after we talked about Jonathan Taylor? Like, dude, you step can, up and you play. can you can look the players in your locker room in the eyes and say, Yeah, we've got after Jonathan Taylor, and and that's why AJ Dillon's on the bench, and it's not gonna cause a rift that is gonna destroy not, the team. Not a single issue. Like, yeah, nobody <laughs> players will say like I get, I get it. I get it. So. Uh, by the way, I, I wholeheartedly believe that if they did a trade, I think Dylan would have been in the deal. I like, I, I would have been like, I don't think that it's like part of something the Colts were asking for, but I think he's in it. Yeah. 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 Um, generally from what I understand, Ballard and Goot generally look at the same type of players. So you would They're assume that they, ath- would be... they both want athletic freaks. Yeah. The RAS yeah. scores for both are just through the roof. They would, they would probably be interested in that situation, especially considering um, at the time, weren't the Colts dealing with like a running back injury too? So they were basically like bringing guys off of the, off of the street to basically be their starters. Yeah. 
So, yeah. So no, either way, probably not something that's going to happen anyway. So uh, a couple other things. Uh, well, let, let's talk Bakhtiari first and then we'll, we'll kind of go lightning round. But are we allowed? Are we allowed to talk Bakhtiari? <laughs> not to Matt LaFleur. Uh, I think he's made that abundantly clear. Uh, let me just say this. I, I really love Matt and I think he does a, a good job in the press, in press conferences and things like that in general. But like, and I totally get and understand him being pissed off if he's asked about it, about practice every single day when you know this is what it's going to be. And that it was the case that way in training camp a little bit where like the first week of training camp, he was asked like almost every day is like, is Bakhtiari going to practice today? And he was like, just like, come on guys, this is, this is going to be all year. Like, what are we doing here? I do think it is a million percent a fair question when he only missed one game last year. After he came back, he missed the first two weeks due to the knee injury the first two weeks and then came back from the knee injury. He only missed one game from that point on due to knee injury. He had the appendectomy at the end, right. but only one game due to knee injury. So, like, it isn't normal for him since coming back for him to miss games. So I th it's very much a fair of, like, why was it that week? What happened? Was there, you know, it, it's a totally fair question. So for him to be like, that's just the same thing. We've been going through this. It's not. There is a difference here because he didn't play a game. And it's fair for the fans to wonder. It's fair for the media to wonder. And I, I understand he's pissed off and frustrated in the situation. Everyone is. And again, if this was just a normal thing where he played and then didn't practice again and he got asked about it, by all means, go off and be frustrated because that's dumb. But this seemed like a legitimately fair question and he had, he wanted nothing to do with it in two seconds. He was very pissy. Um, yeah. Because it seemed like they were trying to ask specifics. And once they were trying to pin down specifics, he was like, I'm done. I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm not going to talk about this, which David Bakhtiar, do you know who DB Cooper is, Andy? The, I know the name. Why can't I put together the person? Help me He was out. a guy who he, he asked for a ransom on a plane and then jumped out in like the Northwest. And people yes, talk yes, about, yes. you know, this hidden treasure of DB Cooper, right? Um, DB Cooper got, Eight hundred thousand dollars, and that is what people, you know, to this day are still in search for. <laughs> David Bakhtiari makes eighty thousand dollars a snap. David Bakhtiari makes a DB Cooper in a drive. No one in the history of the NFL has been more expensive in a three-year span on a per snap basis than what David Bakhtiari has been. The fact that we don't have answers on what the hell David Bakhtiari, it, what the hell is happening with David Bakhtiari. Um, why this is happening so early in the season when you have have a new training regimen where Bakhtiari basically does not practice the entire yep. offseason. That's concerning. Um, the fact that you converted his salary into a signing bonus so early in the contract that he's not even like a trade candidate right now. That's concerning. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and saying, you know, okay, if you're saying this is, this is, what we knew the situation was going to be. And we converted his salary into a signing bonus already. What does that say about next season when he has a $40 million cap hit? Are you just going to convert the salary into a signing bonus? We're just going to pay into the future forever for David Bakhtiari playing half of these games? I think, I, no I, I think there, are, there are fair questions to ask about the situation, and they just don't want to answer it. And I don't know if it's – because it's a mental thing for Bakhtiari. So like talking about it, like turns the boogeyman into to real life or something like that. Cause that's almost kind of what it seems like. Like when he's on the field, he looks as athletic as someone who's never had that knee injury to begin with. Right. It's really like weird. it's a very odd thing to be able to play at an all pro level at left tackle and then not be able to suit up on the field. And that's not even talking about, we haven't even brought up the turf stuff. Yeah. We haven't even brought up the turf stuff or the fact that Aaron Rodgers went down um, he himself said, like, I don't think turf had anything to do with that. Someone landed on the back of my leg and I'm like 40 years old. Right. With Bakhtiari's out here, turf, 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 turf. Rich Eisen does an hour with him talking about all this stuff. Like, I, d I don't know. I don't know how much of this is mental. I don't know how much of this is physical. I don't know if it's a mental thing. Therefore, they don't want to speak it into existence and that we have to play along with that now. I, there's a whole lot of things that are up in the air and the fact that he plays at an all pro level when he's on the field and that they don't want to answer questions just leaves room for some of these thoughts to breathe.
you know? Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, I think this is his last year, no matter what, uh, whether he retires, whether he, yeah. um, whether they release him. I don't, I don't think any team's trading for him, just not knowing what you're going to get out of him. I don't well, think half of them to. can't. Yeah. I don't think they have turf any... surfaces. Like, yeah, that's... like, Oh uh, yeah, that's true too. Um, uh, imagine this team is in a playoff push. I think something like it's something like four of their last seven games or something like that are on turf surfaces. Imagine yep. if this Packers team is in a playoff push, Bakhtiari can just can't suit up. Meanwhile, his brother's like quote tweeting with the you know F around and find out meme about Bakhtiari being in act. I don't yeah. even know what that means. Yeah, I know. I know. How Did people you think you showed it? it to the Packers by not suiting up for a turf game? Is that what I'm to understand? Like, yeah, I don't know. This team gave you eighty million dollars. You played thirteen games, and half of those, one of them, you left after halftime after getting a pass attempt. Like, yeah, really showed it to us. Congrats. Yeah, it. it the whole situation has been so odd and so bizarre, and I'm. I'm in a way, I'm surprised it's kind of gone on this long. Um, but I, I, I just can't imagine a scenario. If he plays the remainder of the season and looks awesome and doesn't miss another game, then I think we just chalk this up to, all right, he had the one game early against Washington last year. He's got the one game early this year, but I just, I don't see it going that way. He's not even, like, what more can they do to preserve his knee? He's not even practicing right now. And yeah. if it's already a problem in week two, yeah. I can only assume that it's going to be a problem moving forward. Plus, you know, you brought up the fact that, like, you know, he had the appendicitis and stuff like that. Um like maybe that gave his knee a rest too. So who knows yeah. if he would have been able to make it through he that entire it. stretch healthy. Sure. I, I I know that's something that no one's going to be able to answer, but um, that's a fair uh, question. I, I uh, last, what, last what would you set the odds right now? David Bakhtiari playing the remaining fifteen games. Uh I'm not betting that he would. In any There's no way. way. There's yeah. no way. Yeah. I, no, I yeah. No chance. It. But what's the over under on how many games you think he plays the remainder of the season? That's probably a better way to look at it. You got to set it at like ten. seven. Yeah, What'd you say? I don't know. I said ten. Maybe that's seven. high. Yeah, maybe that is. I don't know. It's probably somewhere in that seven to ten range. Like I don't know where I'd I can't. Go. All right, I want to talk about this turf thing real quick, very right, quickly, because yeah, sure. I've talked to people in the league office about this a little bit. Um, because I've you know have friends that I had communications with you know when I was doing XFL stuff. Um, part of the problem with the turf surfaces, uh, these stadiums were not built to be football stadiums. These stadiums were built to be multi-purpose stadiums yeah. so that I'm sure plenty of you who are listening right now have a girlfriend who went to that damn Taylor Swift tour, right? Or, or wife or daughter or whatever, right? Like the point of these stadiums hey, is I so I would that... have liked to have been at the Taylor Swift concert for the record. I just didn't get to go, but yeah. <laughs> I, my, my girlfriend, Addie, didn't invite me when she went to Cincinnati. Um, Smart. But so these surfaces, like these stadiums are built to be multi-purpose stadiums, right? Like... The NFL teams, like they bring it, they bring up like uh, the World Cup and stuff like that. One, that's an incredibly profitable event, right? Yep. But Messi, who's the biggest player in the world, and we're seeing soccer explode in America and stuff like that. Like these NFL teams or NFL stadiums aren't switching out their surfaces so Messi could play on grass, and therefore Messi is just sitting out some of these games as a soccer player. Um, so. To replace these NFL stadiums, which, by the way, like are mostly funded by taxpayers at this point, yep. you'd have to build like two more stadiums to, you know, be able to have, you know, in Atlanta, have a, a stadium where, uh, you know, Atlanta United can play soccer. And then also you can hold um, some of these concerts and stuff like that. Two, the other thing that the NFL is actually kind of worried about is looking at all these high schools in the face and saying your playing surfaces are not safe. Right, because there's an increasingly um, uh, an increasing amount of high schools, middle schools, whatever um, surfaces that you know are are turf and are just it's used as a cost cutting measure just because no one has to tend to the fields and you know yep. you can play lacrosse one day and then have soccer you know thirty minutes later on the same field and all that stuff and um, all that and the NFL having to look at all these uh, publicly used fields and say like. Yeah, our players wouldn't play there. What what are the ramifications of that on youth sports? Right? Like it's it's a more complicated thing than just the owners don't want to pay for it. The owners pay for a lot of stuff that they get virtually no use out of. There's 
Um, and this isn't to cape up for owners, uh, other than Packers owners. Hey, I got my, my ownership <laughs> ticket right there. Um, but yeah, I mean, to not allowed stop to this ramble, the loop, by the way, otherwise you could get fined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So to stop my ramble. Yeah. It's just, it's a little bit more complicated than just owners, bad, cheap exploit players, which by the way, if we're talking about exploiting people for profit, David Bakhtiar, you've made $80 million <laughs> and played 13 games. You're making eighty thousand dollars a snap, eighty thousand dollars. So it's a good wage if you can get it. I'll, I'll say that. Yes. Um. Yeah. It. The whole thing is. It, it's. It's mind numbing of how it all got to this point. And obviously, I know it starts with a brutal injury and his body just not responding the right way. I don't know if something went wrong with the initial. I don't know. Whatever. But like, it is massively frustrating for everyone in, involved and concerned and. My, my last question for you is how do you want to make up this offensive line moving forward with or without David Bakhtiari? Because that's an interesting question. Now we learned that Alton has the MCL injury. He's probably going to be out a chunk of time and you don't know if Bakhtiari is going to play any given week. So first, if Bakhtiari is able to go, who's starting at left guard and then any ramifications from that. And if Bakhtiari is not able to go, how are you lining up for, in that situation? Do you know how many snaps Sean Ryan has played for the Packers? On offense, in in general, I think like three special team snaps, maybe one. one yeah, one special team snap, zero yeah, offense. I knew it was snaps. like single digit special team snap. I I only looked it up because uh I I wrote up the the Elton injury and then you know uh, Lafleur said that there's going to be a competition between uh, Newman and Ryan. It's like dude, it's going to be Ryan. Ryan Ryan is going to play left tackle and hopefully teams wait, wait, don't wait. Who, or left Ryan? guard. Okay. He left guard. My bad. Not, not, not left. Did he say bad. specifically Ryan and Newman are going to compete for left guard? Yes. Or, he, he oh, did. okay. I totally missed that. I thought he, I heard competition. I didn't hear that the, the players were involved. Uh, it might've been the reporter that brought up the names, but those that names were, and were I could just miss this question. That's fair. Um, I would like Newman at left guard, even though we haven't seen him a whole lot at left guard. I feel like every time we see Newman, it ends up being at right guard. Yeah. Um, or I guess the, stint at right tackle um i think you keep walker at left tackle and then you just keep nyman in the chamber and it's just nice having that guy in the chamber where you don't have to worry and reshuffle every single little part of the offensive line right um i did think it was interesting they keep rotating in nyman and i didn't get uh that. walker like there were some times where it kind of made sense where they were doing the you bacon stuff where it's like the six offensive linemen looks and Walker is playing tight end. So, like, obviously, he got the reps there. The team clearly was unsure if Bakhtiari wasn't – like, the, the the way that played out, if the team knew Bakhtiari wasn't going to play left tackle, they wouldn't have had Walker play those snaps at Agreed. tight end and practice, right? Um, so that gives you kind of a hint at, at where their mindset is. Um and I guess it kind of made sense, like, you know, Walker has those snaps at tight end. Okay, we bring up Newman, he's going to – or, or uh, Nyman, and he's going to end up playing those left tackle looks. The the ones that didn't make sense to me were the ones where Walker wasn't in and Nyman was at left tackle. I'm like, I don't even know what I, we're doing at this point. I totally agree. That that was one of the more perplexing things because if you're, if you're going to let Rashid – start at left tackle just let him start don't don't you know mess with his confidence or whatever and in like having like you have to do a rotation and I, I didn't think a also i didn't think yash played that well when he was in but then the other thing too is like he the guy's making his first start in the nfl at left tackle and now like all right now you got to go play the extra tight end and be moving around and now you're <laughs> on the right side and then like no now you're out of the game and yash is going to play it's just like just let that guy play left tackle, let him get settled in and not have to think about anything else besides playing left tackle. And if you needed an extra tight end to like fill in through the course of the week, like bring Caleb Jones up or something, like just figure out something and then you're yeah, just use Josh sure. in that role. Like you've got some options there. Um, but I, yeah, or just don't do it. Just go with it. Just put Tucker Craft in or something. I don't care. But like, I would have rather had, I would have rather had Rashid just stay at left tackle, but I'm with you. I think it's going to be if Bakhtiari is there. I think it's Bakhtiari, Sean Ryan, and then Myers, Runyon, Sean and, Ryan. Yeah, I think it's gonna be Ryan. You think you it's gonna be, be Ryan at left guard? I, th I think it might be. I think so it's you, gonna be Newman. You think it's gonna be Newman, and and yeah. you think it should be Newman? I don't know. 
I, I'm, not, I'm not committing. I'm not committing because as soon as, as soon as he messes up a stunt in pass protection like he has the past three seasons, I'm, I'm pulling the plug. But I, I think he's gonna. He has like 1,600 snaps. Yeah, and you're Ryan's never right. played offense before. So. You're probably right. I, I, I don't know. I, I, at least I think the leash is is short there. You, you, do you think there's any world in which they would try like Bakhtiari at left and Rashid Walker at left guard or something like that? If they or or go Zach Tom left guard and put Walker and nine minutes. Yeah, I, I think, don't want I, think them. I think Tom is the guy because Tom is the guy who actually has experience and is cross trained and known all that stuff. Yeah, um, I think so too. If I, the, I don't want the last time time a guy though. started at a position that we haven't seen him practice at except for the week of was, you know, Billy Turner playing Turner. left tackle in the playoff game. Right. So uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe don't do that anymore. So yeah, I mean, Tom, Tom has experience. I think he's the guy you kind of move around and then yeah, play playing Nyman at right tackle, I guess, in that situation. They've never overthought this before and, and messed it up in any capacity over the years to try to never. get their best five guys on the never line. Once. Oh, it'll be interesting. I have no idea which yeah, we'll see. You're probably right. It probably is just Bak if Bakhtiari can go Bakhtiari Newman, and if not, and then it's probably Walker Newman. I don't know. It just it's frustrating. How long, because... do, we, how long do we think Jenkins is going to be out for? Because obviously he's going to miss this week, right? MCL sprain. Yeah. Um, they said he had a big brace in the locker room, all that stuff. But like, how long do MCL sprains usually last? I don't really know. I've only blown out mine. <laughs> I've never I don't sprained know. Mine. But the 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 concerning thing to me was today when Elton was asked about it, and he said he didn't think he was going to be out for the year. <laughs> so... All right, it's going to be a while. <laughs> It's yeah. probably going to be a hot second if he if his comment was something to the extent of I don't think it's going to cost the year. And I mean, maybe he's just being like, you know, three weeks is not going to cost me the year. I don't think it's going to cost me the year. But like, yeah. if you're even using that as your like barometer of like how long it's going to be, to me, that's I don't. My guess is at least a month. But I am not. I can pretend to be a lot of things. Justice, a doctor is not one of them. Yeah, I got no shot. I got no shot at the doctor. <laughs> Uh, this is always amazing. I'm sure we could probably go for another hour, but I uh, should probably save all our uh, amazing takes for the next time we uh, have an episode together. So Justice, tell the uh, the amazing listeners where they can find your work. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at J-U-M-O-S-Q. Um, all my writing, podcasting, all that stuff is at acmepackingcompany.com. Um, we're going to try to have fun this week. Obviously, I'm going to do some breakdowns. I'm probably going to have some stuff that is vaguely – uh, painted in the light of being a Joe Barry apologist. I don't think Joe Barry is good at his job, but I also think we talk about him entirely too much in the context of this defense failing. So keep an eye out for some stuff like that. It's it's uh, it's always the low hanging fruit. If like if, if it's just so easy, defense, it's just so easy. It is. Right? Um, and I, I always do appreciate when you know yourself, Ben Fennel, others will be like, "All right, well, what would you prefer them to do in this situation if <laughs> if you didn't like what happened?" Joe there? Barry finally called man coverage, and everyone is pissed about it. Everyone's mad about it, and that's the thing. Like you have, yeah. It, and the, the crazy thing is, is what they allowed. What was it? Twelve points through three quarters, and it wasn't pretty. But like they had allowed twelve points through three quarters. And the same thing for and the that's offense. With like had, three dropped interceptions too. Yeah, it, like. 24 12 through three quarters you're thinking like if you get like one play go your way this could be like 31 12 and you win going away again and everyone looks great your offense looks great your defense looks great everything looks amazing and just one abysmal quarter where your offense can't do a thing puts your offense in question one abysmal quarter where you can't get off the field at all puts your defense in question like and again it wasn't perfect by either side in the first three quarters but it was certainly winnable and it was not that way at all in the fourth quarter. But all right, go follow him at J-U-M-O-S-Q. You can follow me at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Packaday Podcast. We will together see you guys back here next week as we get ready for Packers Lions and talk about the recap from Packers Saints, hopefully two and one at the time. Uh, yeah, that does it for us. Until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.